Good evening, good morning, and good day, wherever you are. Welcome to Biblical Quests. We are a worldwide scripture study community seeking to fulfill Yah's commandment to his followers to meditate on his Torah day and night so that we may be like a tree planted by streams of water that gives its fruits in its season so all that we do will prosper. This is week 11 of our 52-week cycle of chronological reading through the Torah, prophets, and Yeshua's words, reminding you that we are currently going through year one, which means that today the deep dive will be on the Torah portion in Genesis. The reading and open discussion will explore several sources, in particular the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and the Hebrew English Masoretic. Where relevant, we will also explore extra canonical books as found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. We are humbled and excited to share this journey with you all. Let us pray. Father Yah, we thank you for this time, and may your spirit be upon us. May all that we say and all that we share be a blessing unto your name. As we explore your words, may you reveal your truths to us, and may we be able to share your words in love and humility, and may those receiving be blessed and come closer to you. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Okay. Amen. Welcome everyone. Quick reminder that I dropped the PDF for tonight's study in the recordings channel. This is our master schedule and as you can see this week's portion includes chapters from Genesis, Isaiah and Matthew. We are going to deep dive on the Torah portion this week and we highly recommend that you would read the Prophets and Yeshua's portion at your leisure. So today we are going to deep dive on chapter 39 through 41 in Genesis. We are also going to read a hymn from the hymns of thanksgiving from the Dead Sea Scrolls, hymn number 10. Let us begin. This is Genesis chapter 39. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, a court official of Pharaoh, commander of the guard, an Egyptian, bought him from the hand of the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there. And Yahweh was with Joseph, and he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master observed that Yahweh was with him, and everything that was at his hand to do Yahweh made successful. And Joseph found favor in his eyes, and he served him. Then he appointed him over his house, and all that he owned he put into his hand. And it happened that from the time he appointed him over his house and over all that he had, Yahweh blessed the house of the Egyptian on account of Joseph. And the blessing of Yahweh was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in the hand of Joseph, and he did not worry about anything except the food that he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome. And it happened that after these things his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Look, my master does not worry about what is in the house, and everything he owns he has put in my hand. He has no greater authority in this house than me, and he has not withheld anything from me except you, since you are his wife. Now how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it happened that as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not heed her to lie beside her or to be with her. But one particular day he came into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the house were there in the house. She seized him by his garment and said, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled, and he went outside. And it happened that when she saw that he left his garment in her hand and fled outside, she called to the men of her house and said to them, Look, he brought a Hebrew man to us to mock us. He came to me to lie with me, and I cried out with a loud voice. And when he heard me, that I raised my voice and called out. He left his garment beside me and fled, and he went outside. Then she put his garment beside her until his master came to his house. Then she spoke to him according to these words, saying, The Hebrew slave that you brought to us came to me to make fun of me. And it happened that as I raised my voice and called out, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. And when his master heard the words of his wife that she spoke to him, This is what your servant did to me. He became very angry, and Joseph's master took him and put him into prison, the place that the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison, and Yahweh was with Joseph, and showed loyal love to him, and gave him favor in the eyes of the chief of the prison. And the chief of the prison put all the prisoners that were in the prison into the hand of Joseph. 
and everything that was done there. He was the one who did it. The chief of the prison did not worry about anything in his hand since Yahweh was with him and whatever he did, Yahweh made it successful. Thoughts and insights on chapter 39. Regarding chapter 39, I want to take on the topic of the patriarchs knew the law and taught it to their children. Genesis 39, seven through eight. And it happened that after these things, his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and she said, lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not worry about what is in the house and everything he owns he has put in my hand. He has no greater authority in this house than me and he has not withheld anything from me except you since you are his wife. Now, how could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? And it happened that as she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not heed her to lie beside her or to be with her. So how does Joseph know this statement? How could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? So he knew this was a sin. Many people will say the law didn't come until Moshe came and brought it. And as we look into this and we read throughout scriptures, we definitely can see and understand that there was a law prior to that time. It's just a matter of it being, quote, lost or not followed by the masses. I want to read some scriptures here that will shed light to that more. In the Testament of Joseph, chapter 9, I'll read these verses. For when I was in her house, she was wont to bear her arms and breast and legs, that I might lie with her, for she was very beautiful, splendidly adorned in order to beguile me. And the Lord guarded me from her devices. You see, therefore, my children, how great things patience works, and prayer with fasting. So you too, if you follow after chastity and purity with patience and prayer, with fasting and humility of heart, the Lord will dwell among you, because he loves chastity. And wheresoever the Most High dwells, even though envy or slavery or slander befalls a man, the Lord will dwell with him for the sake of his chastity, not only delivers him from evil, but also exalts him even as me. And this is Joseph's testament to his children about what happened with the master's wife that, he's, that he was talking about. He, once again, talks about chastity and purity with patience and prayer, fasting and humility of heart. So he knew of these things. So let's find out a little bit more about how he knew these things in Jubilees 39. This is Jubilees chapter 39, verses 5 through 8. Joseph's appearance was beautiful, and his master's wife watched Joseph. And she loved him and wanted him to have sex with her. But he did not surrender his soul because he remembered Yah and the words which Jacob, his father, used to read to him from the writings of Abraham that no man should commit fornication with a woman who has a husband. For him the punishment of death has been ordained in the heavens before the Most High Elohim, and the sin will be recorded against him in the eternal books, which are always in the presence of Yah. Joseph remembered these words and refused to have sex with her, and she begged him for a year, but he refused and would not listen. This is Jubilees chapter 12, verses 16 through 27. In the sixth week, in the fifth year of it, Abram sat up all night on the seventh new month to observe the stars from the evening to the morning, in order to see what would be the character of the year with regard to the rains. And he was alone as he sat and observed. And a word came into his heart, and he said, All the signs of the stars, and the signs of the moon and of the sun are all in the hand of Yah. Why do I search them out? If he desires, he causes it to rain, morning and evening. And if he desires, he withholds it, and all things are in his hand. He prayed in the night and said, My Elohim, Elohim Most High, you alone are my Elohim, and you and your dominion have I chosen, and you have created all things, and all things that are the work of your hands. Deliver me from the hands of evil spirits who have dominion over the thoughts of men's hearts, and let them not lead me astray from you, my Elohim, and establish me in my offspring forever so that we do not go astray from now and forever. He stopped speaking and stopped praying, and then the word of Yah was set to him through me, saying, Get out of your country, and from your kindred, and from the house of your father, and go to a land which I will show you, and I shall make you a great and numerous nation. And I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you will be blessed in the earth, and in you shall all families of the earth be blessed, and I will bless them that bless you. 
and curse them that curse you, I will be at a low unto you and your son, and to your son's son, and to all your offspring. Fear not. From now on and to all generations of the earth I am your Elohim. Yah Elohim said, Open his mouth and his ears, that he may hear and speak with his mouth, with the language which has been revealed. For it had ceased from the mouths of all the children of men from the day of the overthrow of Babel. And I opened his mouth and his ears and his lips, and I began to speak with him in Hebrew in the tongue of the creation. He took the books of his fathers, and these were written in Hebrew, and he transcribed them, and he began from then on to study them. And I made known to him that which he could not understand, and he studied them during the six rainy months. All right, so we see that Abraham got a download of information and in turn shares that down through Isaac and Jacob, etc. And some interesting things is that I know I've read before in other places where Noah has information gotten from his lineage with Enoch and so forth and then passes it down to Seth and then now here's Abraham getting a download. And we've read in other books where Abraham does meet up with Seth, but I'd have to look at that one again to see where that was from. But here, obviously, he's getting this information to transcribe and write down. And then next, to also confirm the patriarchs knew the law and taught it to their children. In the Testament of Levi himself, when he's talking to his children at or near his deathbed, he says in chapter 9, verse 6 to 12, and Isaac called me, so this is Levi talking about his grandfather. Isaac called me continually to put me in remembrance of the law of the Lord, even as the angel of the Lord showed unto me, and he taught me the law of the priesthood, of sacrifices, whole burnt offerings, first fruits, free will offerings, peace offerings, and each day he was instructing me, and was busied on my behalf before the Lord, and said to me, Beware of the spirit of fornication. For this shall continue, and shall by the seed pollute the holy place. Take therefore to thyself a wife without blemish or pollution, while you are young, and not of the race of strange nations. And before entering into the holy place, bathe, and when you offer the sacrifices, wash, and again, when you finish the sacrifice, wash of twelve trees, having leaves, offer to the Lord, as Abraham taught me also. So here we get a testament of Levi getting instruction from Isaac, whom was instructed by Abraham. And so Levi is literally explaining how he knew about the priesthood, the sacrifices, all the offerings, and it was by his father, which then came from Abraham. The law, the understanding of it was known, we know at least by Abraham, and taught down to his children and the descendants. And then obviously we see where Moses comes back. They were, they were put into slavery at, down the road and then Moses comes back to free them. And when they're going through the Exodus, obviously the law is brought back and given more detail for all of us to see. And one other thing I wanted to bring up is reading the Testament of Joseph. I highly recommend reading the Testament of Joseph, the whole Testament. It'll give you so much details as to Joseph's struggle with him being sold into slavery, then also with the master's wife and his, that whole situation, then being put in prison. It gives a lot more details in that. It gives you insight as to what he had to deal with and how he dealt with it. Beautiful. Okay, my thoughts. Joseph, rags to riches and beyond. Except for the Judah and Tamar interlude, the Torah dedicates more chapters to Joseph than any other patriarch before him. Why does the Torah choose us to deal extensively with and highlight the story of Joseph? Why does Joseph occupy such a central place in the history of Jacob? Is he important by virtue of being Rachel's son and by virtue of his father's love for him? Or perhaps his traits and character earned him a special status among his brothers. What is so special about him? Joseph's uniqueness stands out from the very beginning, even before his birth. Joseph is not the eldest, but the birth of all the brothers is accompanied by an expectation for his birth. Rachel is Jacob's favorite wife 
and the woman who was intended for him in the first place. And therefore her position in the house of Jacob is clear. She is the mother who deserves to build the house together with Jacob. Leah's efforts on the other end to belong to the house of Jacob are reflected in the names of her sons. One after the other, Leah's sons are born and named with the intention to express her expectation to receive acknowledgement from Jacob. While in the background of Leah's birth is the story of Rachel, barrenness. Leah gives birth and Rachel is barren. Leah gives birth and Rachel is expecting a son. Although Jacob has many sons, the house is constantly watching for and expecting the birth of the special child, Rachel's child. When he is finally born, there must have been great excitement in the house and a feeling that here the special son, the son who will be the foremost son of the family, is finally born. And how is the special son named? His name is surprising. The special son is not named after his own essence, but rather he is named to denote the addition of another son. His name literally means he will add or he will increase. This actually turns out to be the essence of Joseph, the power of adding life and fruitfulness which manifest for the first time in the opening of Rachel's womb, in the very birth of Joseph, and then with the birth of another son, Benjamin. As soon as Joseph's story begins, his relentless essence of blessing and abundance is revealed. At the beginning of his story, Joseph is described as having a special status in the house. This status is also expressed in the dreams he dreams, which are in interpreted by the brothers and by Joseph himself as Joseph's desire to reign, rule, and lead the house of Jacob. It is this special status that brings tension between Joseph and his brothers, and it is this status that leads to Joseph's final degradation. The fall from a high status to a very low position of a slave can cause trauma and humiliation to anyone, especially when it's brought about by one's own brothers. But Joseph's trials and extreme falls are never accompanied by despair, depression, or sense of shame. In fact, within a very short time, he bounces back and is extremely successful. Thanks to Yah, of course. Genesis 39, 2-5 And Yahweh was with Jeso Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master observed that Yahweh was with him. And everything that was in his hand to do, Yahweh made successful. And Joseph found favor in his eyes, and he served him. Then he appointed him over his house, and all that he owned he put in his hand. And it happened that from the time he appointed him over his house and over all he had, Yahweh blessed the house of the Egyptian on account of Joseph. And the blessing of Yahweh was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. Joseph is very successful thanks to his faith in Yah and his special capacity to transcend feelings of despair. Even though Joseph is not necessarily a spiritual figure, but rather a very practical and pragmatic figure, the story emphasizes that his success is not due to his wisdom or his merit, but that Yah is with him. That is, Yah effects a blessing on and through Joseph. Genesis 39.5 Yahweh blessed the house of the Egyptian on account of Joseph. 
the meaning of Yah's blessing here is an addition, increase of abundance that Joseph, as his name implies, brings everywhere he goes. This abundance is not only to do with fertility, but is also and especially to do with material abundance. Upon re reaching a high position in Potiphar's house, Joseph is discarded again to yet another pit. However, here again there is no feeling of humiliation, but rather an immediate recovery and elevation. Genesis 39, 21 through 23 and Yahweh was with Joseph and showed loyal love to him and gave him favor in the eyes of the chief of the prison and the chief of the prison put all the prisoners that were in the prison into the hand of Joseph and everything that was done there he was the one who did it the chief of the prison did not worry about anything in his head since Yahweh was with him Joseph and whatever he did, Yahweh made it successful. Again, Joseph's amazing success is described. He manages to rise from the lowest possible state to a high status and recognition. The blessing for this success, of course, originates from Yah. Following the interpretation of the dreams of the chief baker and chief cup bearer, Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream as well. First, Joseph interprets it, and then he adds a wise, pragmatic advice on how to mitigate the coming doom. His advice has nothing to do with prayers or rituals, and all to do with practical steps to prepare for what's coming. From there, the path to becoming second to Pharaoh in status and power is achieved so effortlessly that one is left in awe. From the most degraded position of a slave and a prisoner, Joseph is elevated to the highest status. With his wisdom and talent, he organizes the storage of food in preparation for the years of famine and then oversees its distribution during the years of famine. The Torah describes the general dependence on Joseph as follows. Genesis 41, 55 through 57. And when all the land of Egypt was hungry, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph. What he says to you, you must do. And the famine was over the whole land. And Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold food to the Egyptians. And the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. And every land came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. And so, Joseph's name truly reveals his essence, an addition, a blessing, a life full of abundance. He manages to bounce back from the deepest pits of life, unscathed, unscarred, stronger than before. The deeper the pit, the higher the pinnacle he reaches next. Full of creativity, resource, resourcefulness, wisdom, magnetism, and pure charm. In the process, he always brings blessings and abundance to everyone around him, always through Yah, and always gives the credit to Yah. The whole story of his life is clear. Faith in Yah, accompanied by walking with Yah, bring blessings, protection, and abundance from Yah, which in turn inspire gratitude, humility, and all glory given to Yah. Yeah, that's a great lesson to learn, and he's a great example of that when we read in his testament, testament of Joseph, he mentions that he went through 10 temptations and passed them all. Yeah. And you see where he ended up. Even when he witnessed one of the eunuchs, I, rem I remember reading where the master's wife went to more or less purchase him as a slave. 
and she gave the eunuch a hundred, I don't know if it was a hundred pieces of gold, so I can't remember, it was a hundred, and uh, the eunuch paid 80. Yeah, yeah. And then, and Joseph never said, a word, said, said yeah. anything, yeah, yeah, so it was just interesting yeah. how he just was, yeah, was, gave the people their honor and didn't disrespect mm -hmm. them in that sense. Yeah, okay, so any comments, any insights from the audience? I thought it was applicable to what we were talking about before the show started about farming and growing things and about how ultimately we have to trust Yah because we don't have any control over the rain and crops, but he does. Yes. So it was good that it's a good lesson to remember how he led Joseph to provide food for the whole country <laughs> and there's no way out of our own intellect and learning we can only do what we can but he ultimately controls everything and provides for us when we look to him yes truly really when i was reading these verses and writing my thoughts i kept thinking about my mother my late mother and it reminded me of her story <laughs> in so many ways and she was probably the most devoured person I met in my life to Yah and walking in, in with Yah and just being so obedient to him and so trusting in him and he always provided for her always even in the most difficult moments and she truly believed that every now and then she would find literally find money because I come from I came originally from a very low income family and we had a lot of hardship and all of a sudden she would find like money in the closet or in a drawer and she was convinced that yeah planted the money there for her so I'll never for, forget it and she had so much abundance even though we were so poor so it reminded me of her reading this that's interesting. What caught me reading this, once again, was the Testament of Joseph, and I, that's why I say I recommend people read it, about how all the things that the master's wife did in, to entice him, played him. He was basically telling her to repent and so forth, and then she would more or less say she will and, and did, and she. It, it was just a whole manipulation of mm -hmm. what she was doing, and then finally he realized that she was trying to manipulate him because he was praying for her. He was praying that yeah. she would have a child so that she would leave him alone mm -hmm. because he initially said when he was brought into the house, she treated him as her son because she didn't have a son. She only had daughters. Mm -hmm. And so he was praying that she, she would get a son so it, basically yeah. she would leave him alone from always being catering to him and stuff. Yeah. And then finally he realized that she was coming after him and all the things she did. So it was interesting. His willpower was amazing. Any other thoughts? Better than she was evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was evil. And think about it. He was very young. He was, what, 17? Let's say he was 18 when she met him. So he was pretty young. And she was um, very manipulative. When you read all the stories from Jubilees, Genesis, and the Testament, so manipulative. And she was very beautiful. And he talked about how she would adorn herself and she would show her legs and her breasts and this and that. And it was just like, yeah. And she was, she definitely was working it on him. Yeah. Amazing. All right. It also reminds me too, is that if, with Joseph being so good looking himself too, and yeah. with him not giving in to her, it probably made her even more angry because if she was beautiful and he was really good looking, and then she probably just got even more angry that he didn't want nothing to do with her. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Once, once you read the Testament of Joseph, she definitely sounds like a narcissist, a classical narcissist. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Okay. Chapter 40. This is Genesis chapter 40. And it happened that after these things, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker did wrong against their war, against the king of Egypt. 
And Pharaoh was angry with his two officials, with the chief cupbearer and chief baker, and he put them in custody in the house of the commander of the guard, into the prison where Joseph was confined. And the commander of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them, and they were in custody many days. And the two of them, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, dreamed a dream one night, each his own dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he looked at them, and behold, they were troubled. And he asked the court officials of Pharaoh that were with him in the custody of his master's house, Why are your faces sad today? And they said to him, We each dreamed a dream, but there is no one to interpret it. And Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. Then the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph, and he said to him, In my dream, thou behold, there was a vine before me, and on the vine were three branches, and as it budded, its blossoms came up, and its clusters of grapes grew ripe. And the cup of Pharaoh was in my hand, and I took the grapes and squeezed them into the cup of Pharaoh. Then I placed the cup into the hand of Pharaoh. Then Joseph said to him, This was its interpretation, the three branches, they are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and will restore you to your office. And you shall put the cup of Pharaoh into his hand as was formerly the custom when you were his cupbearer. But remember me when it goes well with you, and please may you show kindness with respect to me, and mention me to Pharaoh and bring me out of this house, for I was surely kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and here also I have done nothing that they should put me in this pit. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also dreamed. In my dream, now behold, there were three baskets of bread upon my head, and in the upper basket were all sorts of baked foods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket upon my head. Then Joseph answered and said, This is its interpretation, the three baskets, they are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift your head from you and hang you on a pole, and the birds will eat your flesh from you. And it happened that on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants. And he lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker in the midst of his servants. And he restored the chief cupbearer to his cupbearing position, and he placed the cup in the hand of Pharaoh. But the chief baker he hanged as Joseph had interpreted to them. But the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. Thoughts and inside on chapter 40. Do not interpretations belong to God? Genesis 44. And the chief of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. And they were in custody many days. These two were the cupbearer, by implication butler, and the baker of the king of Egypt. The timeline may have been one year as it led up to Pharaoh's birthday celebration. So this term, they were in custody many days. I've, I know some people speculate that they were in prison for a year, but it's not quite clear on that. And so on this interpretation of the visions, I broke it down here. The chief butler's dream of a vine with three branches it budded, blossomed, and its clusters of grapes grew ripe. He squeezed the grapes into the cup of Pharaoh and then placed it into the hand of Pharaoh. The interpretation Joseph gave was three branches were three days. In three days, Pharaoh will restore you to your position. The chief baker's dream, three baskets of bread were upon his head. The upper basket were all sorts of baked foods for Pharaoh but the birds were eating them out of the basket upon his head. Interpretation from Joseph was the three baskets were three days. In three days, Pharaoh will hang you on a pole and the birds will eat your flesh. So I tried to look into any other references to the baker, the baker's dream and the cupbearers, but there was really nothing more in any of the other books mentioning this. So I can't give any more depth, but we see that the dreams were relative to their position. The wine bearer or the cup bearer or the butler, I should say, since he was the one who puts the wine in front of the Pharaoh, his dream was the grapevine and squeezing the grapes out and giving it to the Pharaoh. And then obviously the chief baker was about bread and baked foods for Pharaoh and how they interpreted it into what they were, what they meant by Joseph. But yeah, that, that's basically the breakdown of that. I don't think there's anything new on, on that to really talk about.
I, I didn't have nothing came to me when I was looking at it other than the three days and the vine reminded me of Yeshua but I, I didn't have enough inspiration to put all of this together but there is something here that connects to Yeshua and I feel like it's a parable or like it feels like a parable that Yeshua would tell but I couldn't put it together it just didn't come to me when we talk about the so. producing fruit the fruits of the spirit so if you look at the cupbearer's dream it was producing fruit and that fruit was then being given to the king and that's what we are to do we are mm -hmm. to produce fruit fruits of the spirit here in this world and we are given crowns of glory so to speak and what do we do with them we give them back to the king yeah that's a great uh, image i got out of that part and then as far as the baker goes I think it was... Uh, I just I, got stuck on the bakery. It's just, but I think we didn't get enough details and I looked everywhere for more details on why well, they were in prison. What did they... Just to get some more pointers. And What I got yeah. out of the baker, I wanted to say, is that he was supposed to... The main thing of bake is bread and we have the bread of life. But he didn't have bread in that basket. He said all sorts of baked foods. So I think that could be looked at as he didn't have the bread of life in his basket. He had all sorts of other baked mm, goods, so good other one. idols, that type that's, of thing. That's, a good yeah, that's one. Yeah. what I was thinking, and that's why he didn't make that's it. That's a good one. Yeah. So it okay. is a power bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think I just turned it into one. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay, so do not interpretations belong to God. I'm going to talk about supportive scriptures to that in Genesis 4, 8. We read in Daniel 2, 28, But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what it is that will be at the end of days. This is your dream and the visions of of your head on your bed. So God is the one who reveals these mysteries, these dreams, and interprets them to, to his people. Amos 3, 7. Surely my Lord does not do anything unless he has revealed his secrets to his servants, the prophets. So visions and dreams, if we're having that, should bring humility, which is the opposite of pride. We read in Job 33, 13 to 17. Why do you contend against him, that he will not answer all your person's words? Indeed, God speaks in one way, even in two, yet someone does not perceive it. In a dream, a vision of the night, when a deep sleep falls on men slumbering on their bed, he opens the ear of men, and he frightens them with a warning to turn human beings aside from their deeds and he keeps man from pride. So the, these dreams and visions should be to bring warning, fear to us in order for us to do what is right and do the right things and keep us from pride, bringing humility. So that's what the dreams and visions should be doing to people. And I think we've witnessed that where people share their dreams and visions that they may have, a lot of them end time type of stuff. But it should bring humility to them and for them to turn away from the worldly things and to come to Yah. Okay? And then what about interpretations? I'm going to dip a little bit into interpretations, especially with tongues, when it comes to this. Second Peter 1, 17-21, For he received honor and glory from God the Father when a voice such as this was brought to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this voice brought from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. And we possess as more reliable the prophetic word to which you do well if you pay attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Recognizing this above all, that every prophecy of scripture does not come about from one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men carried along by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Also note, Peter is telling us that we possess the reliable 
prophetic word, the Tanakh. He's referencing the Tanakh when he's talking about that because they didn't have a New Testament back then. <laughs> they were, they were. And then let's talk about this when it says, recognizing that, uh, this above all, that every prophecy of Scripture does not come about from one's own interpretation. Let's read in 1 Corinthians 12, 10 through 11. To another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing of spirits, to another kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But in all these things, one and the same spirit is at work distributing to each one individually, just as he wishes. So this word tongues is a Greek word, and it's of uncertain affinity. The tongue, by implication, a language. That's the definition that is used for this word. Now the term uncertain affinity can be used to describe something that is difficult to classify or categorize or that has unclear connections or relationships to other things. In some contexts, it may refer specifically to a word or concept in a particular language that is not well understood or that it does not fit neatly into an existing category or classification system. However, the exact meaning of the term can vary depending on the context in which it is used. This suggests that it can be a different language or even a parable or dialogue of unrelatable information that one would not comprehend. And my thought on that is if someone is talking about something and most people are like, what's he talking about? Is he, it makes no sense what this guy's talking about. There might be a person that can interpret that. And that would be a gift of interpretation of tongues. And I have witnessed that. So it, it may not be someone speaking in another language and you understand it. It may be someone just talking nonsense, but you're able to understand what they're actually meaning with that. Continuing in 1 Corinthians 14, 26 to 28. Therefore, what should you do, brothers, whenever you come together, each one of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation, all things must be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it must be on one occasion, two or at most three, and one after the other, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must be silent <laughs> in the church. Yeah. But let him speak to himself and to God. So he's not condemning it, but he's saying if no one can interpret it, or if you can't even interpret it, don't speak it. If someone is speaking in tongues, there must be an interpreter. Otherwise, they must be silent. So I want to touch these scriptures with, in regards to interpretations, and when it comes to tongues and interpreting them, and also prophecy with interpretations. So I hope that was helpful for everyone. Yeah, it was. I was reminded when he, when Joseph said, that aren't the interpretations to God? Don't they belong to God? Yeah. I was reminded of Deuteronomy 29:29, in which Yah is telling us that the mysteries belong to Him. Yeah, yeah. And He reveals to us whatever He chooses to reveal to us. So that's why the interpretation or solution in Hebrew he says pitronim which is so it's like a solution to a problem or to a mystery and that's what it means so that's why he, he says Yah owns those solutions those yeah. uh, and I think he gave yeah. me one with the bread the baker yeah. and the butler there because <laughs> I, I never thought I just it just came to me that's, that's interesting yeah yeah Okay. Okay. So, any thoughts, any insights, any comments on chapter 40? When you were talking about Shua, about the interpretation of the baker, I was thinking what came to my mind was Yeshua when he was doing the Last Supper with the wine and the bread. Yeah. Because it does say that the three baskets, that there was bread in the basket, but the top one had the baked goods. So I, it, as soon as Ronnie said that, I thought that's what immediately came to my mind was Yeshua in the Last Supper. I don't know if there's any connection with that. It's just something that just came to my mind as soon as she had said that. Yeah, and I thought that, but I think in the top basket he had other baked goods. 
and that's what I that's what I thought. We are supposed to have a single focus on Yah, but I think he had other baked goods in there as his top basket and on his mind basically. And so he had quote other idols, gods in there as that example. And so that's why I think he was put to death. But I think it would be interesting to follow that trail of looking again at the last supper and that there is something in that story because there is way more hidden in that story than revealed yeah maybe it has something to do with judas yes being put, there's something i just thought of that just as he was yes. saying just put the house. yeah because yeshua says the one who Dip, isn't it? He dips the, his the, bread into the yeah, thing with him. Yes, dips yes, the bread yes. into the yeah. oil with him. Yeah, that's the there one that's going to deceive him. I'm telling you, there, yeah. the moment I read it, I was like, "This is." It sounded like a parable that Yeshua <laughs> would tell, and I feel like the and yeah, maybe the Last Supper and this. It uh, it really it's it de it demands like more studying and looking into the Last Supper and this story. I think there is. A, a lot hidden here that could be revealed in in uh, prayer yeah. under prayer and more studies yeah any other thoughts i do have something on interpretation <laughs> okay. so yeah the, this is something that's obviously in pentecostal church is a huge thing and i remember years for years my they, it always seemed to target my husband in these interpretations when they would go and somebody would be speaking in tongues or something and my husband's just such a like a no-nonsense type of a person he'd be like are you kidding me and, and they'd always be asking like do you speak in tongues or the circle of going into pentecostal that's oh you're not saved because you don't speak in tongues and that but i think that people don't really realize that there has to be someone there to actually interpret it and it really aggravates me when we do things like this or that you see people and i just think it just really quenches the spirit when we just think oh people are rambling and doing all these things and i remember and it only happened once to me in my life i was in a situation where i felt that the ruach was leading me to go to this place and we couldn't find it and i ended up to be quick in the story and then we found the place that i was supposed to go and we entered into it with me and my friend and they were speaking another language and i was like i think we're in the wrong place <laughs> and i felt the spirit say no you're to enter and so anyways long story short that we when we went into the place they were speaking and i didn't even i didn't even know the language that this place was speaking but at the end of it i end up interpreting something in another language for this per for these for this pastor that was at this church which kind of really blew my mind because it was so random and so totally led by the spirit. And I thought, wow, wow that is, that's what it means to walk in the spirit and being to, to give someone interpretation because he had really waited, was waiting for somebody and had been praying about that. They knew somebody was going to come and give them some sort of word of interpretation. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being me. And I didn't even know what language they spoke. <laughs> so I did find out later what language they spoke though. It was Portuguese. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a, that's a beautiful story. Lately, there is more and more of this Pentecostal slash charismatic movement, how can I say movement. Yeah, movement around yeah, the they're US. They're and I saw some of the videos with this preacher that I think that preacher looks scary to me when I look in his face. I don't know, it doesn't give me good vibes. But he mumbling nonsense and no one knows what he's saying, but everyone thinks that he's channeling the Holy Spirit. And I, me, with my 15 years of experience on my resume of life with the New Age, I can tell you that there are many spirits that are being channeled many spirits from the dark side that are being channeled by New Age. Do the they do a similar thing? Oh yeah. Speak in a different kind of... They can speak mambo jumbo or they just start channeling. Part of, oh, that's part of their channeling Like you have another voice or uh -huh. like another voice coming out of them and all this. And so for me, it reminds me of that. And it doesn't give me good vibes that it's actually coming from the Holy Spirit. Are you familiar with the congregations in Israel that are actually really doing this? The same thing too? There's, a, there's some really weird stuff that's going on in i think jerusalem some of these congregations where they're like 
doing this mumbling and rolling and laughing and all these things and it's really becoming a big thing in Israel. I wasn't sure if you knew about that. Is it like a Jewish or a messianic congregation? No, they're messianic. Ah, okay. No, I'm no, I'm not. If you have a, a link to it, Please send it to me. We almost went to one of those when we were in Jerusalem. We looked for a group, a messianic group, just to go and connect with the uh, local messianic people in Israel. But it just it, it ended up we couldn't go. It didn't work out. Yeah, it didn't work out. So <laughs> that would be interesting to see. If, so if you have a link, please send it to us. This is Genesis chapter 41, and it happened that after two full years Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he was standing by the Nile, and behold, seven cows, well built and fat, were coming up from the Nile, and they grazed among the reeds, and behold, seven other cows came up after them from the Nile, ugly and gaunt, and they stood beside those cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly and gaunt cows ate the seven well-built and fat cows. Then Pharaoh awoke, and he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were coming out of one stalk. And behold, seven thin ears of grain, scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears of grain swallowed up the seven plump and full ears of grain. Then Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And it happened that in the morning his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called all of the magicians of Egypt, and all its wise men. And Pharaoh told his dream to them, but they had no interpretation for Pharaoh. Then the chief of the cupbearers spoke with Pharaoh, saying, I remember my sins today. Pharaoh was angry with his servants, and he put me and the chief baker in the custody of the house of the commander of the guard. And we dreamed a dream one night, I each with a dream that had a meeting. And there with us was a young man, a Hebrew servant of the commander of the guard, and we told him the dream, and he interpreted our dreams for us, each according to his dream he interpreted, and it happened just as he interpreted to us, so it was, he restored me to my office, and him he hanged. Then Pharaoh sent and called for Joseph, and they brought him quickly from the prison, and he shaved and changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I dreamed a dream, but there is none to interpret it. Now I have heard concerning you that when you hear a dream you can interpret it. Then Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in my power. God will answer concerning the well-being of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Now in my dream, behold, I was standing on the bank of the Nile, and behold, seven cows, well built and fat, were coming up from the Nile, and they grazed among the reeds. And behold, seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly looking and gaunt. Never have I seen any as them in all the land of Egypt for ugliness. And the thin and ugly cows ate the former seven healthy cows. But when they went into their bellies, it could not be known that they went into their bellies, for their appearance was as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke, then I saw in my dream, and behold, seven ears of grain were coming out of one stalk, full and good. And behold, seven withered ears of grain, thin and scorched by the east wind, sprouted up after them. And the thin ears of grain swallowed up the seven good ears of grain. And I told the magicians, but there was none to explain it to me. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, The dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows, they are seven years. And the seven good ears of grain, they are seven years. The dreams are one, and the seven thin and ugly cows coming up after them, they are seven years, and the seven empty ears of grain, scorched by the east wind, they are also seven years of famine. This is the word that I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. Behold, seven years of great abundance are coming throughout the whole land of Egypt. Then seven years of famine will arise after them, and all the abundance in the land of Egypt will be forgotten. The famine will consume the land. Abundance in the land will not be known because of the famine that follows, for it will be very heavy. Now concerning the repetition of the dream twice to Pharaoh, it is because the matter is established by God, and God will do it quickly. Now then, let Pharaoh select a man who is discerning and wise, and let him set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint supervisors over the land, and let him take one-fifth from the land of Egypt in the seven years of abundance. Then let them gather all the food of these coming good years, and let them pile up grain under the hand of Pharaoh for food in the cities, and let them keep it. Then the food shall be as a deposit for the land for the seven years of the famine that will be in the land of Egypt.
that the land will not perish on account of the famine. And the plan was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. Then Pharaoh said to his servants, Can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all of this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and to your word all my people shall submit. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his finger and put it on the finger of Joseph. And he clothed him with garments of fine linen, and he put a chain of gold around his neck. And he had him ride at his second chariot. And they cried out before him, Kneel, and Pharaoh set him over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, but without your consent no one will lift his hand or his foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called the name of Joseph Zaphonath Pena and gave him Asenet, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, as a wife. And Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Now Joseph was thirty years old when he stood before Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and traveled through the whole land of Egypt. And the land produced a plenty in the seven years of abundance. And he gathered all the food of the seven years which occurred in the land of Egypt. And he stored the food in the cities, the food of the field that surrounded each city he stored in its midst. And Joseph piled up grain like the sand of the sea in great abundance until he stopped counting it, for it could not be counted. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph, whom Asadet, daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore to him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has caused me to forget all my hardship and all my father's house. And the name of the second he called Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortune. And the seven years of abundance which were in the land of Egypt came to an end. And the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had said. And there was famine in all of the countries, but in all the land of Egypt there was food. And when all the land of Egypt was hungry, the people cried out to Pharaoh for food. And Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, Go to Joseph, what he says to you, you must do. And the famine was over the whole land, and Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold food to the Egyptians. And the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. And every land came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain, for the famine was severe in every land. Okay, thoughts and insights on chapter 41. So I had a lot of deja vus when I was reading these chapters. So let me start with the book of Esther. A lot of the terminology, uh, there were a lot of sim similarities, so I wanted to list them. So there are many parallels, linguistic and content, between the story of Joseph and the story of Esther. Even the life stories of Joseph, Esther, and Mordechai bear an amazing resemblance. So let's look at it. Joseph. The story takes place for most part outside of Canaan in Egypt. Esther's story takes place outside of Israel in Persia. Joseph ascend to a high position in Egyptian government. Esther and Mordechai ascend to high position in Persian government. Joseph, a change of name gives Joseph a new sense of self. Esther, a change of name gives Esther a new sense of self. Joseph, Joseph upon reaching this high position save the Israelites from famine. Esther and Mordechai upon reaching this high position save the Jews from being killed. Joseph, the ruler of Egypt is saved from death from famine by Joseph. Esther, the ruler of per Persia, is saved from being murdered by Mordechai. Joseph, Joseph rises to high position through a combination of beauty and wisdom. Esther rises to high position through a combination of beauty and wisdom. Joseph, in Joseph's life, a good deed he does is forgotten for a long time, interpreting the butler's dream. Esther, Mordechai's good deed of saving the king's life is forgotten for a long time. Joseph, through sleep, the dreams of Pharaoh, Joseph was remembered and brought to solve them. Esther, through lack of sleep, Ahasuerus learned of the fact that Mordechai saved his life. Joseph, one of the chief servants of Pharaoh, the baker, met death by hanging. 
Esther, the chief servant of the king, Haman, met death by hanging. Joseph revealed himself to his brothers after a feast. Esther revealed herself as a Jew to the king after a feast. Joseph, the language of the collection of the grain in Egypt is similar to the language of the gathering of the women in Persia. Then, number 12, Joseph, the language of the description of the tempting of Joseph is similar to the language of the attempt to influence Mordechai to bow to a man. Next, Joseph, similar language in the way that Joseph and the Jews stood the test, the Israelites. <laughs> no, yeah, and the Jews in Esther stood the test. So the language is very similar. That's why I keep mentioning it uh, one point after another. And the last one is seven verbs similar in how Joseph was elevated to high position in Egypt and Mordechai in Persia. Literally, the same verbs, the same description of clothing and jewelry and how everyone was supposed to kneel to them. Like, like a great deja vu, at least when you read the Hebrew uh, transcript. Okay, so the chief characters in both stories, Joseph and Mordechai, are away from home, and they are away from home involuntarily. Joseph is stolen away from Canaan, sold by his jealous brothers to a caravan of traders headed down into Egypt. Mordechai is descended from the captives of Nebuchadnezzar. He is identified as being from the tribe of Benjamin, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captives that had been carried away with king by Nebuchadnezzar in 597 BC. That means, according to the most plausible reading, that he was a child of the fourth generation removed from the beginning of the Babylonian exile. The chief characters in both cases are sold into slavery. This term is used regarding Joseph, and in Esther we read, For we are sold, I and my people, to be destroyed. It is the same root in Hebrew, and in no other passage in the Bible is a major figure sold or described with that language. Both Joseph and Esther are propelled along in their stories because they are physically attractive. This gets Joseph into trouble because he declines Potiphar's wife's repeated advances. But had he never been tossed into prison, the rest of the story could not have happened as it did. Esther's beauty results in her being cho chosen as queen. Aside from the story of Samson and perhaps Jacob's love for Rachel, there are no other cases in scripture where physical attractiveness plays such a significant role in the unfolding of a story. In Samson's case, it is a distracting and unimportant aspect of the story. In Rachel's case, too, it hardly figures at all in the ensuing narrative. But in the case of both Joseph and Esther, the narratives unfold as it does precisely because of the physical attributes of the chief characters. Both Jacob's family led by Joseph and the Jews of Persia led by Mordechai and Esther have a chance at the end of their respective stories to leave exile and return to their homeland, but they do not do so. In the case of Joseph, we know from the text that it was supposed to be seven year famine, five years of which were left at the time of the story. Joseph was 44 when the famine ended and 110 when he died. So there was plenty of time for him to have returned to Israel or Canaan, had he so desired. Indeed, he did return very temporarily to bury his father Jacob, but he then turned around and went back to Egypt. At the end of Esther's story, the triumphant Jews could also have chosen to return to the land of Israel had they wanted to. The time would have been at least mildly propitious, but they did not. 
And last, with all of these parallels and similarities, there is one conspicuous difference between the two stories. The book of Esther does not explicitly mention Yah even once. There are only two books in the Bible that neglect to mention Yah, and the book of Esther is one of them. And by the way, that's the book that I'll get to it. Joseph repeatedly relies on Yah, declares the ultimate power of Yah, and gives all glory to Yah. Esther and Mordechai don't acknowledge Yah at all. The book of Esther appears to be anthropocentric. It does not contain any distinct religious practices or concepts such as God, prayer, the covenant, sacrifice, the temple, the promised land, as well as virtues such as love, kindness, mercy, and forgiveness. Maybe that's why it was left out of the Qumran scripture library. Interesting. Yeah. Continuing with my deja vu's, what's in a dream parallels between Joseph and Daniel? The accounts of Joseph before Pharaoh and Daniel before Nebuchadnezzar have many similarities in plot, motif, and even language. Both feature kings with disturbing dreams that reveal the future. Both young exiles demonstrate the superiority of their god by outshining the royal experts. Both captives deny superior ability and credit Yah with their knowledge. In both accounts, the onlookers believe the man's ability resulted from the spirit of the holy gods in them. Finally, both Joseph and Daniel achieve great political power. So let's look at it. The many similarities between the lives of Joseph and Daniel are striking. Both are taken out of their land. Both are carried away as slaves. Both are handsome. Both suffer unjustly. Both demonstrate impressive wisdom. Both are put in the service of Gentile kings. Both interpret dreams for the king. Both end up in a prominent position as a result of their dream interpretations and are given a place of leadership in a Gentile empire. Both are blessed, blessed in their tasks. Both play a role in the preservation of their people while passing through a great crisis. But there is also a profound difference between Joseph and Daniel. Joseph is a prototype Christ, while Daniel is not. Joseph was born as the favored son, but destined to rule the entire family. Joseph was rejected by his family and sold for the price of a slave. Joseph suffered unjustly at the hands of the Gentiles. Joseph passed through his test and was exalted. He maintained a position of great power and influence. Joseph was deeply joined to the Gentiles by marrying a Gentile woman. I related to the crafting in of the Gentiles in Yeshua's case. Joseph had a position of power and supplied food for Egypt, the nations, and for his family, Israel, so they would survive the crisis. Joseph's suffering resulted in salvation for the Gentiles and salvation for his family, Israel, during a seven-year crisis. The story of Joseph ends with reconciliation when Joseph is received by his family. So we are yet to get to the last bullet yeah, in like Yeshua's story. Okay, continuing. So Yahweh's men in Pharaoh's court. The Joseph narrative is both the culmination and conclusion of the book of Genesis, and it is also the transition to the book of Exodus and the rest of the Pentateuch, a masterfully told tale that fills nearly a third of the book. The Joseph narrative further develops all three elements of Yah's promise to Abraham, land, seed, and a relationship of blessing. The account of Joseph before Pharaoh establishes him as Yah's man for that time in Israel history. It also demonstrates the sovereignty of Joseph's God, who disrupts 
the world of a powerful monarch and upends his kingdom with forces far beyond the control of Egypt's finest. Both the baffling dream and its spat on fulfillment demonstrate Yah's sovereignty. The Egyptian experts do not understand the message of this God, much less have any power to thwart him. Joseph insists that Yah alone has wisdom and power, and both are his to give and take. Daniel attests to this too. In Daniel 2, 20-23, Daniel said, Let his name, the name of God, be blessed throughout the ages, for the wisdom and the power are his, and he changes the times and the seasons, and he deposes kings, and he sets up kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men who know understanding. He reveals the deep and the hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness, and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my ancestors, I give thanks and I give praises for the wisdom and the power you gave to me. And now you have made known to me what we have asked from you, for you have made known to us the matter of the king. Through Joseph, Yah prepared a haven for the Israelites to weather the famine. But they did more than simply survive. While Egypt and the surrounding lands languished, the sons of Israel acquired land and were fruitful and became very numerous. The seed of Abraham in jeopardy through most of the patriarchal narrative appears to be in good stead for the first time by the end of Genesis. However, Abraham's descendants are living outside the land of promise. The land piece of the promise to Abraham is yet to come. By speaking to the Gentile kings, whose influence most affected the Israelites, i.e. Pharaoh during the patriarchal period and Nebuchadnezzar during the Neo-Babylonian period, Yah sent a clear message to all involved that he was the God of all the nations, not just Israel. Neither Pharaoh nor Nebuchadnezzar had met a God like this one. His messages eluded them and their experts and the dream's fulfillment exceeded any power they or their gods might have claimed. The God of Israel was also the God over Egypt and Babylon, whether or not they liked it or acknowledged his sovereignty. Notice how the God of Israel didn't send the enigmatic messages until he had also put one of his servants in place to interpret the message. And even then, both texts are clear that the ability to explain the dreams came from Yah. Joseph and Daniel were only able to interpret the dreams because in the language of the Gentile kings, the spirit of the holy gods was in them. In our language, it's the Holy Spirit. Their access to Yah's wisdom came from Yah himself, and Yah's wisdom was made available to the Gentile kings through them. These two accounts reveal a God who bothers to communicate to Gentile kings. In their respective contexts, they each show the sovereignty of Yah and his establishment of his men in the foreign court. Through his lowly servants, Yah puts the mighty Gentile kings on alert that they are dependent on him for their lives and for their kingdoms. The prophet books are rife with ex examples that support this revelation. So if we look at, if the slide will... If we look at Ezekiel 30, 1 through 16, we see an example of Yah speaking to the king of Egypt through Ezekiel. Okay, and he says, Son of man, prophesy, and you must say, Thus says the Lord Yahweh, Alas for the day, for a day is near, indeed a day is near for Yahweh, a day of cloud, a time of the nations it will be. 
and a sword will come in Egypt, and anguish will be in Cush at the falling of the slain in Egypt, and they will take its wealth and its foundation will be demolished. Cush and Put and Lud and all of Arabia and Kub and the people of the land of the treaty with them. By the sword they will fall. Thus says Yahweh, and the supporters of Egypt will fall, and the majesty of its strength will go down from Migdol to Sain. By the sword they will fall in it, declares the Lord Yahweh, and they will be desolate in the midst of desolate countries, and its cities will be in the midst of ruined cities. And they will know that I am Yahweh when I put my fire in Egypt, and all of its helpers are broken. On that day, messengers will go down from before me in the ships to to terrify unsuspecting Cush, and anguish will be in them on the day of Egypt. For look, it is coming. Thus says the Lord Yahweh, and I will put an end to the crowds of Egypt by, by the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. He and his people with him, the most ruthless of nations, will be brought to destroy the land, and they will draw their swords against Egypt, and they will fill the land with slain and i will make the nile streams dry land and i will sell the land into the hand of bad people and i will lay waste the land at its fullness by the hand of strangers i yahweh i have spoken so as we can see here another example of how yah speaks to gentile kings and is also operating through gentile kings so in this case he's going to use nebuchadnezzar to destroy Egypt. Yeah, a lot of people don't understand that the scripture says Yah gives and Yah takes away. Yeah. A lot of people don't get that concept. It's all they just think it's blessings and love and there's curses, there's things that you aren't given and there's reason that we may not understand unless mm -hmm. he wants to reveal it, but there's reasons for all of that and that's what people have mm -hmm. to understand. Yeah. And I also brought an example from Jonah when Yahweh is sending Jonah to speak to Nineveh. Okay, so he's sending again a servant of his to go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the message that I am telling you. Okay, and then Jonah finally, after trying to escape the mission, he finally goes to Nineveh. And he yells and tells them, 40 more days and Nineveh will be demolished. And the people of Nineveh believed in God and they proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least important, the king's proclamation. And the news reached the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne and removed his royal robe, put on sackcloth and sat in the ashes. So again, Yah is, is communicating directly to Gentile kings. And then in Nahum 3, 18 through 19, your shepherds are sleeping, O king of Assyria. Now the circle is closing and Yah is speaking to the king of Assyria. No one can gather them. There is no healing for your wound. Your injury is fatal. All who hear the report of you will clap their hands for joy concerning you. For who has not suffered at the hands of your endless cruelty? Okay, so basically Yah elevates those kings and then he destroys them and it's all part of his plan and it's all part of his uh, I would call it like the chess game yeah, it's all for um, refinement for yeah, his people yeah thoughts any insights any comments from anyone I like the comparisons you did with Joseph and Daniel and Joseph and Esther those were very interesting how many yes. similarities there are in those stories and storylines yeah I have a question do you know if it was the same Pharaoh for Joseph when he was promoted as the same one who put him into the prison? Yeah, the same Pharaoh didn't put him in prison. It's his master Potiphar put him in prison. And while he was in prison, there were the butler and the baker. So the same Pharaoh that put the butler and the baker in prison is the Pharaoh that took him took Joseph out of prison and elevated him 
Okay, I see. Because it, yeah. So Potiphar wasn't the pharaoh; he was the second in command. Was that what it was? Or I don't know. He wasn't the second in command. He was just an official. He was a powerful person, but he wasn't second in command. Oh. Okay. I've oh, read. Thank you. Yeah, I've read. I can't remember where that pharaoh was also possibly the priest of On when it's mentioned. Like uh, what? Like it's the same. Same uh, one, yeah. yeah. It, I've heard that before it, too. It's almost the same name. This one is Potiphar, and the other one is Potiphar. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's possible. Uh, yeah. That uh, he was a priest of a high position, and uh, whether it was second or I don't know about that, uh, as far as that goes. But uh, he was definitely in a high position, and he was the one who threw him, put him in prison due to what his wife. Yeah. Exclaimed. I've always had a really hard time with the Book of Esther, and I know that it's never been found with the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I just, oh, I think yeah. it's, in my opinion, it's a plant, but I'm not 100% sure about that. But I've always had issues with the Book of Esther, so I thought that it was interesting because I do know that it's one of the books that's never been found, not even a fragment of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. But I thought it was interesting how you compared the two. I've not seen that before because I've always seen Joseph compared to Yahusha, other things, and, and I really liked how you com compared Joseph with Daniel's dreams and that. Thank you. Yeah, I felt like I'm having so many deja vus because of the language that was used, and that started me on a rabbit trail. And I do want to mention something that most recently they claim that they found they found a fragment of the book of Esther so I researched it and what they found is like a tiny piece of that has like just a few words on it and it doesn't even correlate with anything in the book of Esther but they are desperate to, to salvage the situation, in my opinion, and put the book of Esther, give it more credibility. But if you ever hear about it, just know that piece that they found has nothing to do with the book of Esther. And actually, from what I understand, the few sentences on that piece actually match Esdras. Okay, the book of the I think it matches either first or second Esdras. So that would be amazing if actually in the DSS they had the books of Esdras. Uh, yes. Esdras. I that love, would I be amazing Esdras. because Esdras is it's a prophetic book. It's so prophetic and so messianic. And definitely the, the rabbinic uh, Jews are not going to be happy with anything to do with Esdras being found in the DSS. So I think they are just engineering it to be as though they found the book of Esther, they did not find it. Yeah, I read that article and it was saying, there was one article that said about the book of Esther not being found in the Dead Sea Scrolls and, this, and then it says, a thing, or is it? <laughs> then you read the article to find out that, yeah, I think that they're just being really desperate. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. So none of you asked me what is the second book there because I said two books in the canonized Bible don't mention Yahweh. You know what the second book is? The Song of Songs. Song of Songs? Yeah, Song of never Songs. mentioned. And really, I personally think the Song of Songs has no place in the canonized Bible. It shouldn't even be there. No. I really think it's an erotic uh, type of books no. between men and a woman. I don't know if King Solomon wrote it or not, but in any case, I have a lot of personal issues with King Solomon as it is with what he did and how he brought the doom on Israel. So for me, that's another uh, pointer to contemplate about Song of Songs that it never mentions yeah even once. Interesting. Yeah, I agree with that as well. I think it shouldn't be in. But I, we, I was talking, I was thinking about last night, I was talking to my husband about, you know, about the resets and stuff. And you see all these things about the 1800s and all these things are happening. And I thought, I don't think it's a coincidence that that's when they, the canon came out of the 66 books of quote unquote of the canon in the 1800s. I just thought that was really peculiar too of how, and I really do think that they've taken a lot, hit a lot of things because when you talk about the book of Ezra, is it, I really do believe that book was really prophetic. And I think it's Ezra that even talks about 
that Yah, when he had written the books, and I could have them mixed up with the prophet, said that they were to hide them away for the last days, and then slowly a lot of these books are coming out. Yes. And I think that I see that today, that we see a lot of these other kind of books, like the Testaments of the like of the 12 patriarchs, yes. and, and just some of these other books that are coming out that we never had in our original canon. I often thought it would be really interesting to learn or find somebody about Ethiopia because I was reading an article stating that the Ethiopian Bible is actually the oldest one that they claim is even older than any of the ones that we even have and they have some of these extra biblical texts that were never taken out of their Bible so I thought that was quite interesting. Yes, I agree. Yep. Yeah, I actually have the complete uh, Ethiopian Bible but in English of course. Regarding the text variants Cares. Zero variance between all the versions, the Masoretic, Septuagint, and so that's amazing. And then I wanted to share a hymn, a Thanksgiving hymn from the Dead Sea Scroll that reminded me so much of Joseph and Yeshua at the same time. And you will see why, when I start reading it, I wanted to share it with you. But keep in mind when you see them, like that, 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 keep in mind that those words are missing. So sometimes a sentence is incomplete. On the right side of the screen, you will see the actual scroll of that hymn. So hymn number 10 from hymns of Thanksgiving or the Yacht from the Dead Sea Scrolls. I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you set straight in my heart all the works of injustice. You set the guardians of truth against my iniquity and the reprovers of righteousness against my every wrongdoing. The wound, of afflicted, the wound afflicted upon me, comforters of strength and pro proclaimers of joy, for my deep sorrow. So the wound afflicted upon me are the comforters of strength and proclaimers of joy. Proclaiming peace for all my destruction, the strong to make me lose heart and those who encourage me. In the face of affliction, then you give the appropriate reply to my uncircumcised lips and you support my soul by strengthening my loins. And restoring my strength, you determine my steps within the domain of wickedness so I become a trap for the rebellious and a cure for all who turn from rebellion. Prudence for the fool and a steadfast mind for all the reckless. You have appointed me as an object of shame and derision to the faithless, but a foundation of truth and understanding for the upright. And because of the iniquity of the wicked, I have become slander on the lip of the brutal and scoffers gnash their teeth. I have become a torn song for the rebellious, and the assembly of the wicked have stormed against me. They roar like a gale on the seas when their waves churn. They cast up slime and mud, but you have appointed me as a, as a, a sign for the chosen of righteousness and an informed mediator of wonderful mysteries, so as to test the men of truth and to try the lovers of correction. I have become a man of contention for the mediators of error but a purveyor of peace unto all the seers of righteousness. I have become impassioned against those who seek flattery, so that all the men of the sea roar against me as the sound of the thunder of mighty waters. All their thoughts are as the plots of Belial, and they have transformed a man's life whom you established by my word and whom you taught understanding into a pitfall. You placed it in his heart to open up the source of knowledge to all who understand, but they have changed them through uncircumcised lips. 
and a strange mes message into a people with no understanding that they might be ruined in their delusion. I give thanks to you, O Lord, for you have set my soul in the bundle of the living, and you protect me from all the snares of the picked. Ruthless men seek my life while I hold fast to your covenant. They are the fraudulent counsel for the congregation of Belial. They do not know that my appointment is from you. By your mercies you save my life, for my very steps are from you. Their attack on my life is from you, that you might be honored by the judgment of the wicked, and that you might display your might through me against the children of men. For I stand in your mercy. And I said, mighty men have camped against me. They have surrounded me with all their weapons of war. Arrows burst forth unceasingly, and the blade of the spear devours trees with fire. Like the roar of mighty waters is the clamor of their voice, a cloudburst and a downpour to destroy many. Wickedness and fraud burst forth to the stars when their waves pile high. As for me, though my heart melts like water, my soul shall hold fast to your covenant. But as for them, the net that they spread for me will catch their own foot, and snares which they hid to take my life, they themselves fell into. Meanwhile, my foot stands on level ground, far from their congregation. I will bless your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord, for your eye stands over my soul, and you have delivered me from the jealousy of the mediators of lies, and from the congregation of those who seek flattery. You have redeemed the soul of poor one whom they plan to put to an end pouring out his blood because he served you, because they did not know that my steps are directed by you, they appointed me for shame, and scorn in the mouth of all those who seek deceit. But you, my God, have helped the soul of the destitute and the poor against one stronger than he. You have redeemed my soul from the hand of the mighty. In the midst of their reviling, you have not terrified me. That I might abandon your service for fear of ruin at the hands of the wicked, or exchange a steadfast, steadfast mind which that for a delusion. Statutes and by testimonies you establish me to strengthen the flesh, destruction for all their offspring, a tongue according your teachings and <laughs> a lot of that at that at the end anyway just wanted to share this with everyone i thought on that reading was it very interesting and remind about let me see it says by your mercies you saved my life for my very steps are from you their attack on my life is from you that you might be honored by the judgment of the wicked. So by the wicked punishing or attacking the righteous validates the punishment that they're gonna get. The righteous ones are the ones who are gonna receive the, I guess you would say, the punishment from the wicked here and now to prove themselves, which also validates the judgment that's gonna come upon the wicked. So it's like a cycle that works. It's which side do you want? Do you want to be on the wicked side where you can enjoy, somewhat enjoy, you're still not even guaranteed, even if you're wicked, in this life to in all, all the prosperity of this, quote, this life. But on the righteous side, if you're acting in righteousness, you're going to suffer at the hands of the wicked. But the ultimate is in the next life, obviously the reward is great. All right. Thank you, everyone, for participating. And uh, Father, may, may you bless each and every one that hears or watches what we have presented and all of the discussions here tonight. May you bless each and every person. May it cause them to research, cause them to pray, 
and seek out your truth and your ways, your word, and may you bring them more understanding, may you bring them wisdom, and may you bring them love. Father, we bless your name and all that we do and say in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.